Continuing the book of Galatians this morning, if you want to get there in your Bibles, we'll be down around, uh, we'll start in verse 15 again, and look at that and talk our way through some of the, the passages following that. <clears throat> we uh, said last week, or we talked about last week in verse 15, that please God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And we talked about last week uh, what that meant to be separated from his mother's womb and what the implication was of that and why. We talked about why was Paul chosen in the first place. He was the Jew of Jews, and yet he was chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And we discussed the, the reasons behind why that was the case or why that might have been the case in that process. Uh, the simple answer is that's what God decided to do, and so that's what he did, and that's good enough for all of us. But uh, there's some reasons behind that that seem to make sense as to why he would do that. And we talked about a little bit, spent a little bit of time on looking back in the Old Testament at passages that foreshadowed the coming of the Gentiles into, into God's family. And that's going to continue on through the, the book of Galatians because one of the issues we've said that the book of Galatians was written to address was something within the church where there were those, we call them Judaizing teachers for lack of a better term, who seemed to want to bind on Christians, the church, the old law, and especially circumcision. You have to do that in order to go to heaven. And Paul is writing to say, that's not right. And he defends that. And in defending that, he's having to defend, as we said earlier in the, in the chapter, having to defend his own apostleship. Because those people who were fighting against him were saying, well, Paul, he's not really an apostle. He wasn't one of the original. He's this Johnny-come-lately, and so therefore we just don't have to listen to him. And uh, so we talked about the idea of, of why Paul, Paul is defending, defending his apostleship. And that's part of what's going on here in the last part of verse 16. He said, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, talking about after his conversion. He didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And last week we put up this map to show us kind of where we think Arabia was and all the, uh, all the designations there in Tan or the modern names for the places that are around there. Uh, it shows you where Jerusalem is in relation to Damascus, where Paul was when he was converted and where he went to Arabia and then came back to Arabia. And then Arabia is the area there in that little uh, blue circle, uh, and that's just my own drawing, so that's not an accurate map, but general area of where he went. And uh, what was the definitive reason we said he went to Arabia? Come on. Definitive answer. We don't know. That's right. That's the definitive answer. <laughs> we don't know why he went to Arabia. We we can guess, we can surmise, there's all sorts of fanciful theories out there. Books have been written on why somebody thinks Paul went to Arabia, and they can go as, uh, you know, as far-fetched as, well, he, he went and saw aliens or something. You know, it was just, uh, as long as we're imagining, we can imagine anything. Uh, probably the most reasonable idea is he was, while he was there, was communing with God, communing with Christ and learning what he needed to do in order to be the apostle to the Gentiles and preach the gospel and all of those things. And we said that, you know, even though Paul so embraced Christianity, just from a human standpoint, to go from being such a devout hater of the church, supporter of, of, of Judaism, to preaching the gospel, your mind just doesn't flip a switch and change that quickly. And so it would take him time, and this time he spent in Arabia may have been his reprogramming himself, if you want to use that term, getting his mind wrapped around what he was going to be doing from that point forward in the rest of his life. And again, all this is conjecture because we don't know, but it's, it's interesting to think that uh, what might have happened there in Arabia. And then it says in verse 18, after three years he went up to, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James and the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. And as we ended class last week, a question was asked about that idea of after three years. Because it sounds, just looking at Galatians, it sounds pretty simple. Okay, 
I went to Arabia. I came back to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. And if that was the only narrative we had, that'd be simple enough, wouldn't it? Doesn't say how long he went to Arabia, how long he stayed in Arabia, but once he got back to Damascus, it was three years later he went up to Jerusalem. But when you compare that to the account of his conversion in Acts chapter 9, there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say disconnect because that's the, not the right term, but it raises some questions and there are those who have uh, said, well, trying to figure this out. And before we go any further, figuring out this three-year period here has nothing to do with our salvation, correct? All right. Curiosity, wanting to better understand the Bible, yeah, it's important for that. Uh, but, but how we come down on this doesn't make a difference uh, when you stand before God and, and he's not going to ask you, okay, which theory do you take of that? And that's going to depend on whether you get into heaven or not. But it's interesting, interesting to think about, and since it, the question was brought up, uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and talk about that. Uh, let's, I know it's probably pretty small, but uh, Acts chapter 9. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and this is when Paul was converted. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogue, that he was the Son of God. Then all who were heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the same name in Jerusalem, and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. And so... Acts chapter 9 mentions nothing about the foray into Arabia. It doesn't talk about that at all. And so there are those who are probably a lot smarter than me and most, smarter than most of us who say, okay, how do we work this out? And so I'll offer you the, kind of the three of the leading theories of that, and uh, you can make your own decision. We'll suggest perhaps what uh, could be the solution to that. But again, that three years, uh, when did that three years start? Uh, timeline theory the three years started when Saul went to Arabia um, and again just looking at Galatians that doesn't really fit does it looking at Galatians because Galatians says I went to Arabia came back to Damascus then after three years I went up to Jerusalem and so just based on that account uh, this particular theory doesn't quite work however the reason this one seems to be promoted is that this allows three years for all those things that supposedly happened in Arabia. And there are those who say, well, you know, Saul was doing whatever he was doing, meeting with Jesus or whatever the case may be. And so this, this theory allows those three years for him to, to learn and all of that, to change his mind and all of that in, in understanding uh, what he was doing. And so that's theory number one. Theory number two, the three years started when Saul returned from Arabia, which seems to mesh with uh, the, again, the Galatian account. And the third theory is the three years started at his conversion. And again, one of the things we need to keep in mind is at that point in time, they didn't always think about time the same way we do. And so we have to understand that their time, reckoning of time was, shall we say, more fluid, different than what we do. When you were born, you were a year old. That entire year, you were a year old, is how they looked at that. So when you had your first birthday, you were actually, in their reckoning of time, what? Two years old. And so, uh, again, that's one of the things we have to understand is how they looked at time and, and dealt with time. And again, as we said, none of this matters to our salvation, but it's kind of interesting. And so this is, just seems to be a, a good timeline from that. It starts at Damascus, whatever theory you take. He was converted in Damascus. That's where this entire narrative starts. He spent some days with the disciples, according to Acts chapter 9, verses 19. And that idea of some days, how long was that? 
Again, it's vague, isn't it? And, um, um, you know, I picked up a few things at Walmart earlier this week. How many did I pick up? I don't even remember, but I picked up a few things at Walmart. Because it's, it's, a, it's what, what was that? A hundred dollars worth at least. Because you actually we went to Walmart this week and got out of there for twenty dollars and twenty six cents. Can you believe it? Yeah, just one little thing that we needed, but that's neither here nor there. So he spent some days with the disciples. So that that gives us another idea. What is some days? The term some can mean very few. It can mean very. It can mean whatever you want some to mean. Uh, then he goes to Arabia, Galatians one and verse seventeen, the last part of that. Then he returns to Damascus. Uh, and, again, trying to mesh these two accounts together, he preached in the synagogue, Acts 9, and after many days the Jews plotted to kill him, to kill Paul. And so, again, there's that some days, many days, uh, kind of a, a generic term for we don't know exactly how long it was. The disciples free Paul from the Damascus in a basket. Paul comes to Jerusalem. Or that's the same time, three years later, he went to Jerusalem and he was going in and out in Jerusalem. The Hellenists attempted to kill him there. He was sent to Caesarea and then Tarsus. And then he went to Syria and, and Cilicia uh, from there. And so looking at that, um, obviously the three years in Arabia, probably unlikely. Uh, not to say that he didn't, but, but talking about here the three years, uh, from the time he returned, the only problem with that is he preached in the synagogue and after many days the Jews plotted to kill him. And again, so many days to me sounds like less than three years uh, in, in that process. And so a good number of the scholars that you and I would, would trust and, and uh, would, would read uh, suggest that this three years was after his conversion. And again, somebody points a gun to your head and says, say that, well then say it. Or if they say, say, say something else, then you say something else because it's not that, again, it's not that big a deal. But it's one of those things where when you've got two narratives and trying to mesh them together, sometimes it's not as easy to do that. Pam? Um, when I look at the book of Acts, I think it would be a long period of time mm -hmm. from when Jesus died. But according to the Noah and Megan Lay Bible, it was only six years since the death of Jesus when this all happened. Yeah, yeah. It, some of this happened rather quickly, and and just because just because you read a story, let's say you read a novel, and it, it will say this event happened, this event happened, this event happened, and then most of our modern writing will say, and ten years later, three years later, two months later, a week later, this happened. But that's not always the case with the Bible. It, it can be written in a sense that, especially when you go back to, let me get back to the slide here. Uh, verse 26. Then the disciples took him by night, let him down through the wall in a basket. Some would argue that that's when he went to Arabia. And then there's a gap between verse 25 and verse 26 when he came to Jerusalem and tried to join himself with the, the disciples. And so, again, bringing this up not because it's that important but just so if you start reading in a commentary and you read about that you'll understand where that's uh where that's that's coming from thoughts questions comments maybe you have the definitive answer for that i hope you do that'd be nice Flo. i just don't see it that way okay yeah mm -hmm. this verse the only other question i know at that time was when the lord was laid out after nor did I go to Jerusalem to consult with those who are apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia and later returned to the city of Damascus. Mm -hmm. Then, then years later, yeah. I went to Jerusalem. Yeah. I think that's way after Damascus. Yeah. Three years yeah. ago. Yeah. We don't know what happened. We don't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was learning. Maybe God was touching his heart, preparing. But we don't know. He says, then I went three years yeah. later. So that's all after. Arabia, I mean, yeah. yeah, again, looking at looking at Galatians, just looking at Galatians, it's really clear to me. It's what happened. Went to Arabia, Damascus, then three years later went to Jerusalem. But again, when you add Acts chapter 9 into that, it adds a little bit of, of 
ambiguity to that idea. And again, Mike Nelson was not here to defend himself. He's the one who asked that question. And so, uh, and and I, I wish he was here to explain if he had a unique perspective on that, but obviously with Jerry in the hospital, he's not here this morning. Uh, so, uh, but once the question was asked, uh, we give it a little attention and uh, I'll leave you to decide what you think uh, about that. Uh, uh, however you want to think about that. And if you want to do further study and suggest some other ideas, you feel free to do that. We'll listen because it's always interesting to, to delve into God's word. Um, so after he went, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's uh, brother, uh, spent 15 days with Peter uh, in, that, in that context. And uh, we'll keep going because that explains itself when we get down there. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. You ever kids ever say to you, I'm not lying. Yeah, they had their fingers crossed. So what this wording here, these things I write to you before God, I do not lie. Why does Paul say it that way? What's he trying to convey to his audience in the churches of Galatia? Somebody's accusing him of lying. Okay, somebody's accusing him of lying. Uh, again, he's still defending his ministry, still defending his apostleship. Somebody has accused him of lying, and he's saying, I'm not lying, and he's using God as a witness. Before God, I am not lying. And if it was just that statement, then how might you take it? Yeah, okay. But then he goes on with the rest of the book to, to present his argument as to what's going on. These things I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. And, and again, the things he's just written to them, they are knowable. There were people who knew he went to Arabia. There were people who knew he came back to Damascus. There were people who knew when he went to Jerusalem. And even Peter could testify that Paul came to him and talked to him. Uh, we don't have any record of that, but Peter knew that happened. And he also saw uh, the other apostle James while he was there. And so he's not saying stuff that can't be verified. He's saying stuff that can be verified and I just want you to know I am not lying. I have no reason to lie. I have no desire to lie because that would serve no purpose. Uh, afterward, then, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which, again, mesh with uh, Acts chapter 9's account uh, because he went to Antioch and then went to Tarsus. Which Tarsus was in Cilicia. Antioch was in Syria. And so that meshes up with his travel itinerary, uh, as he mentions there in Galatians and as it's mentioned there in Acts chapter 9. All right? Questions, thoughts, comments? Jill? You're not lying, he's hanging true. Mm -hmm. So when he, when he is a sick, he's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave? Well, uh, I think maybe it was slipping your tongue, but I think Paul's point is that he did not get any of his information from any of the apostles. Mm -hmm. He said he, he, he met with none of the apostles. And he said, James, the Lord brother, Je Lord brother James was not an apostle. Right, right. So, so uh, I think that's the whole point Paul is trying to make is his his gospel, his defense is direct from Jesus, mm -hmm. not from any yeah. any apostle whatsoever. Sure, and and that's that's the point I think he's trying to make. His apostleship was unlike any other apostleship. Because Jesus chose the twelve, they spent the three years of his ministry with him, and going in and out, listening to him teach, and all of those things. And then Paul, who was, as he said, born out of due time, uh, was brought in later. And so his apostleship was different. The qualification of that is, it's not different because Jesus chose him just like he chose the rest of them. And that was on that road to Damascus when the bright light shone around him, and, and Jesus talked to him at that point in time. Diana? Diana? And he had to keep announcing, you know, these things God had to do. 
and now I realize that I've done things wrong. He had to confess some things to our people because they remembered him as being mm -hmm. the person that persecuted God's children. And all of a sudden, he came back and he said something different. So I think with that, um, of course, God was with him with that. But even talking to the apostles, he had to go and say, hey, you know, I didn't come through the way you did, and I didn't come through the way that normal, that the rest of the apostles did, but God had correctly guided me through this. So I think that was kind of a little tough on his portion, but it took a lot of people praying to kind of grow him. Maybe he was talking like that there was a lot that really were not shared at the time. Sure, absolutely. If Saul, again, putting ourselves back in that circumstance, in that time frame, if Saul walked, if we were exist in existence there at the Pike Speak Church of Christ in those days, and the apostle or Saul walked in and said, I'm preaching Jesus Christ, what would be our response? I don't think so. Security, security. Uh, because everything they had heard about him was that he was a persecutor of the church, and he was. Everything they had heard about him was true. And now for him to make this 180 degree about face, I might be skeptical of that because I might think this is his new tactic. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, exactly. I'm going to pretend that I preach Jesus so I can get inside the church. And Don and Connie Nemitz, you're going to jail when I find out you're here. And, you know, would that be the way the church thought back then? Well, sure. Uh, that's the way any of us would think. And so he was continually having to defend himself and and deal with that, and that only added to his, uh, his the difficulty of his ministry. And again, I think it was last week, it may have been Dave who pointed this out, if I, if I remember correctly, but when it was explained why Saul was chosen, it was said that he might what? Suffer. Uh, and so there, there's more to this story than just God saying, oh, Paul would be a good guy, let's get him involved in this. It's a bigger story than that, much more uh, involved than just him be, being chosen to be the, the, the preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and a lot of that we don't understand or don't know, but that's why God chose him. And, uh, you know, read that account. I was shipwrecked. I was hungry. I was cold. I was naked. I was beaten. Uh, all those things that he suffered uh, as a result of his uh, preaching the gospel uh, Difficult things, suffering uh, for the cause of Christ, and he did it willingly, and he did it completely, and he never gave up on it, even to the point where he, if tradition be right, was beheaded there in the in the city of, uh, of Rome uh, after he had been there for some time. Dave, and then well, you consider all Dave, the, and then Dave. <laughs> you consider all the big deals in Acts about choosing a replacement for Judas, mm -hmm. so that they could so that they could have twelve apostles. You know, all of that big deal is there, but there's very little big deal about Paul being a 13th apostle. And, and you know, I, I'm not sure that I wouldn't, I'm, I'm, that I wouldn't be questioning uh, Paul's apostleship as well, you know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I were in their position, because <clears throat> Jesus didn't, just didn't clear it up. The Lord didn't clear it mm -hmm. up all that well for, for Paul. I mean, uh, Peter had to be convinced. Others had to be convinced that, that, uh, that Paul was an apostle. There didn't seem to be any direct revelation from the Lord saying, okay, we're making an exception. We're going to have 13 now. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so it was, It was again, it was distanced by time, uh, distanced by lack of really any revelation other than what we have that we're reading about why he was chosen. And so people to be skeptical, that's that's natural. And Paul had to prove himself uh, in that concept. David? And even before his conversion with his meeting with Ananias, he knew he was going to suffer. And so anytime you mention 2 Corinthians 11, mm -hmm. that list, I think back to, I think it's chapter 4, where he said, light and momentary troubles. Mm -hmm. That he knew he was going to suffer, but in his mind, they were light and momentary compared to the blessings of eternity. Sure. And then one other thing, the, the word apostle, you know, doesn't always have the capital A. Mm -hmm. 
in front of it. Mm -hmm. And there are places where apostle is used clearly not talking about the 12. Right. Because apostle means an envoy, mm -hmm. a messenger. Sure. And so, you know, sometimes it's unclear whether they mean the the ones selected specifically mm -hmm. by Christ, or is it a messenger sure. of the church? Yeah. And Absolutely. So I, it can be both. Many apostles in that it case. can be both in that in that sense. But but an apostle in the sense of the authority of an apostle. And that's what Paul is definitely talking about. Right, right. Paul is saying, I have the authority. I'm not just an envoy, I have the authority of the the twelve. Uh, along with me. Diana? Well, I was just looking and I understood what Dave was, Dare Barry was saying. Christ chose the apostles, but at one point Judas betrayed God, mm -hmm. and then Matthias was chosen by the 11 apostles, and God approved them. Mm -hmm. So, where they were chosen by Jesus themselves, you know. Um, so, later on, when Paul comes on the scene saying, I was chosen, they didn't get to witness what they had when they were chosen and traveling with Jesus. And then when Jesus did what he did, the 11 apostles were able to make the choice of who the guy was mm -hmm. using yeah. to uh, make him the, the 12th because of Jesus. Yeah. And so there wasn't a set formal way that it happened with Matthias and with Paul, and that probably for. For some, maybe the apostles themselves said, wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. And uh, so we have to, have to keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> talking about his, I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea who were in Jerusalem, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And then the key there is verse 24, and they glorified God in me. So Paul's visit, Whatever he did, again, all, all we know is just what we've read, and that's very limited information. But whatever he did must have been convincing enough that we've got verse 24. They glorified God. This is a good thing. Uh, and, and however he did that, whatever uh, discussions were had, whatever uh, witnesses were brought forth, again, Barnabas, we've got to we've got to thank God for him because Barnabas is the one who took him and said, "He's one of us now." And Barnabas had the credentials and the history and the background for people to know him and believe him, and for him to say, "He's one of us now," then everybody said, "Okay, we can we can deal with that." Ellen, well, Paul also had the miraculous Holy Spirit sure. assisting with him too. So all these people that received tongues and other gifts and everything that was. Uh, you know, if somebody came in and said, well, now you can do this and I can do it, I'd say, wow, that's got to be Paul because he's got the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Janelle? Weren't the 12 sent to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles? Yes. And Paul, as number 13, was sent to the Gentiles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was the order. They were sent first to, to the, their fellow Jews. Uh, you'll be my witnesses in Judea. Samaria, and then where? Ends of the earth. Paul was already after that. When that had already happened, they had already reached out by the time Paul became a, a, a Christian. And as a result, he was the one specifically chosen for the Gentiles. And later in Galatians, we're going to find uh, Paul talking about the fact that Peter was the apostle to whom? To the Jews. And so Peter had a specific mission, and his mission involved his own people, Paul had a specific mission, and that was to be involved with preaching to the Gentiles. And so, <clears throat> again, uh, this is the way God set it up, and when, when people begin to understand that, uh, again, they glorified God in me, Paul said. And uh, that, that was a good thing. Bill? If you go back to verse 21, he went to uh, Syria and Cilicia, mm -hmm. geographically distant from Judea. Mm -hmm. So now in Judea, they had known him as the person who was persecuting the church. And then they get a report from these other churches that, hey, this guy's now one of us. So there was some communication amongst the churches, mm -hmm. but it says he was personally unknown to those in Judea mm -hmm. except as one who had persecuted them in the past. Yeah, they, they heard of him, they knew who he was, but he hadn't been, shall we say, in their face, so to speak. He didn't go there for the purpose of being introduced to the Jerusalem church and say, hey, here, welcome Paul. 
that didn't happen. He was just dealing with uh, with Peter and and with, with uh, uh, James in that context. <clears throat> and he, wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall to hear what that discussion was like between Paul and Peter? Well, for some reason, God decided we didn't need to know that or have that information, and so we have to just uh, <clears throat> leave that to our our own speculation. But they glorified God in me. Whatever happened made enough difference that they accepted Paul in his role as an apostle, as a preacher of Jesus. And that kind of smoothed things over so that Paul could go on his way and keep doing what he was doing with the full support of the churches in Judea. And so there was that unity that existed there. And so and it, Bill mentioned the idea of communication. There was obviously communication between these churches and what was going on and we don't have that communication the extent of that communication but obviously they were in touch with each other uh, in keeping up with what was going on in, in the things surrounding all the, the events of that day chapter 2 then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me and I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles but privately to those who are a reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So, 14 years later, whenever we start that timeline, he goes back to Jerusalem. Barnabas and Titus go with him. He said, I went up by revelation. I went up and communicated to them the gospel which I preached to the Gentiles. Why did he need to do that? Ellen? Because of persecution of the uh, fellow Jews priests and whatnot, and they had to go to, uh, they had to make a decision on how they were going to give the paperwork that was sent out to all the mm -hmm. churches of how you were to become a Christian, because of the problem of the circumcision, this and that, I kind of shortened up real quick, mm -hmm. but that was the main reason. Okay, all right, so, he... He communicated to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Uh, we'll talk about that privately. Lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. What, does, what insight does that give us into what Paul was doing? Dave? Well, the, the Jerusalem church was the focal point. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why he did it. A revelation flies that Jesus told him to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the why he did. Yeah. So I, I think Jesus in his wisdom said, look, you need to make sure that, that, uh, that because here he says, I spoke to those who seemed influential. So it was important to have the people of influence on board with him. Okay. So. so can we say that the purpose of this visit was this gospel you're preaching to the Jews and this gospel I'm preaching to the Gentiles, what do they look like? The same gospel. Which again, he said earlier, <laughs> another gospel. You're going after another gospel, which isn't a gospel at all. And so here's a, a, a time when they come together, those who are concentrating on preaching to the Jews, he who was concentrating on preaching to the Gentiles, and in essence, to use our model, they're comparing notes about what they're preaching. And not just, and I don't think they were thinking, well, maybe I've got something wrong, or maybe Jerusalem's got something wrong, or Peter's thinking Paul's got something wrong. But it was just to convince them we're preaching the same thing. We're all on the same page here. We all have the same message here. And what we're preaching is the same, whether it's to Jews or whether it's to Gentiles. And then there's going to be issues about that because of the, the Judaizing teachers but it was a, a chance for them to, to find that unity uh, in, in idea and doctrine that we're preaching the, the same very thing. Dave? <clears throat> Time, timeline, I kind of wonder if this didn't occur after Peter's experience in Acts 10, chapter with Cornelius. Because that was a lesson for Peter, for Peter to, mm -hmm. to come to the understanding that the gospel is not for the Jews only, but for the Gentiles as well. And so he, he said two or three times there, he said, now I understand. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if, if uh, maybe timeline-wise yeah. this might have been, while Peter's got this fresh on his mind, and he comes to Paul and say, 
Now let me explain to you what God's plan is for the Gentiles. And, and confirm to Peter what it was that was going on so that Peter was fully convinced in his own mind about what, what was going on. Flo? Well, if, uh, if God had come back and taught us something a little different mm -hmm. the Gentiles and the Jews, again, you would have credibility problems. Sure. That's his whole life. It's about credibility, mm -hmm. track record, because of what he did in the past, and trying to establish that he was real. If he had something different in his message, he would have said, here we go again. Yeah. Can't trust him anymore. Sure, can't trust him because he's preaching a different a different gospel. Steve, if you want an example of uh, how Paul constantly had to defend himself and his apostleship and his ministry and everything, uh, set, I encourage uh, us to read Second Corinthians eleven. Uh, it's a really good uh, chapter that goes into Paul's reasoning mm -hmm. and why he's defending himself and the reasons he's preaching. Sure, absolutely, and and uh, you know there's so much to this story, and we're trying to stay within Galatians, and it's kind of hard to stay there because there's so much more to this story that you want to talk about. Uh, real quickly, we heard the first bell. Uh, this comes out of the New Living Translation, and the last part's what I want to focus on. I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement, for fear that all my efforts had been wasting, and I was running the race for nothing. Again, verify, <laughs> confirm, make sure we're all. Uh, doing the same thing, New International. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Uh, again, <coughs> Paul had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so we, we know that. But even with that, he still wanted to, to confer with those people who were there originally just to make sure for both our sakes that we're preaching the same thing. But I was just thinking, if you said at the beginning of verse 2, he went up by revelation. Mm -hmm. I don't think he went on his own accord. I think that he was moved somehow sure. by yeah. God or by the Holy Spirit. Said, hey, go up there and get all this confirmed. It'll help wipe out all these yeah. rumors that are going on about you. Yeah, exactly. Could Paul have had doubts? Sure. I mean, Paul's human, just like us. And so he could have had some doubts. There could, and again, all these people pushing against him and pushing against him and pushing against him and pushing against him. There could have been nights that he went to bed wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing right? And by revelation, as we said, he went up to Jerusalem, go up there so you feel better about all this. So you can get together and know that what you're doing and what they're doing is, is the right thing. Uh, English Standard. In order to make sure that I was not running or had run in, in vain. And again, he didn't go to the whole church. He just went to those who it calls influential in the gospel. I don't think that means just the rich people in the church, although they probably were influential, but those people who were lead in the leadership roles within the, within the church uh, at Jerusalem so that we know that we're doing the right thing. And then he hits verse 3. And we're not have time to talk about this because we're going to run out of time. But he goes back to why he's writing this book in the first place. And that's the Jew-Gentile controversy. Got to be a Jew to be a Christian, said some. Others said, no, you don't have to do anything Jew Jewish to be a Christian. And that was where it came from. And so in the midst of all this timeline and all of that, he comes back to, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, why does he say that? What's the point he's making? Forget the old law. Forget the old law. Titus, who was a Greek. That implies who knew he was a Greek. Everybody. It wasn't hidden. Didn't bring him in and say, oh, yeah, he's kind of sort of a Jew. Don't worry about him. No. Titus was a Greek. He was known to be a Greek. That was an issue. And he came to Jerusalem, and nobody in Jerusalem said, wait a minute. You've got to be circumcised. And that message wasn't for the people in Jerusalem, but for those people he's writing to in Galatians, in the, church of, the churches of Galatia. He went to the heartland of Judaism. He went to where the temple was. He went to where Judaism reigns supreme, and yet not one person in the church suggested that Titus needed to be circumcised. And yet here you are in Galatia, hundreds and thousands of miles away, and you're insisting that that has to happen. 
And so again, he gets back to his point, gets back to his narrative about what he's talking about. You don't need to be a part of the law. You don't need to follow the law in order to be a Christian because that law, what happened to it? Nailed to the cross. And it's no longer uh, an active part of what we do as Christians. All right? We're out of time. Appreciate your participation this morning, and we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next Sunday morning.